Good morning and welcome to APC. We're so glad that you've been able to join us for our online service today. Before we head into our worship service though, I have a little announcement I would like to make for you. It has been two very, very long years, but we are so excited to be able to say we are finally able to have our kids camp this summer. So July 25th to July 29th, we will be turning APC into an island. We are super excited. We would love for your kids to come. So if you have a student who is entering JK in September, um, all the way up to those who are entering grade six in September, we would love for you to join us. Just head to our website at apcalliston.church, click the registration link and make sure you let us know. We're really excited for you to be able to come. Before we head into worship, let's open our service in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you once again that we have the privilege of just being able to come together wherever we are, um, whether we're sitting at home, whether we're sitting in our church service today, wherever we are in this moment, we know that you are with us. So Lord, I just ask that your presence will fill the room that we are in, Lord, that your spirit will speak into each of our hearts and our lives, speak into the circumstances that we're all walking through. Lord, I pray that you will soften our hearts to hear the word that you have placed upon Pastor Dean today. And Lord, as always, I pray that we will be doers of the word and not just hearers. Be with us as our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's head into worship.
So when we've exhausted every single way with our bodies weak, with our voices string, you are still the song in us that never ends. We can't help but stand and start it all up. So when we, so when we've exhausted every single way with our bodies weak, with our voices string. Still a song in us that never ends. We can't help but stand and start it. One more time this morning. So when we within us this morning, Lord, we exalt you. We just bring our worship to you, Lord, and we, we ask that you be magnified in this place today. It's all for you, Lord.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Good to have you with us today. This first Sunday in the month of June, we're moving along. The weather is warm. We're happy. The winter is behind us. And we're excited that you are here with us today. It's Communion Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, and we will be taking communion together as we come to the end of our preaching time. So if you can have the elements ready with you there where you are, some kind of juice or some liquid for the drink that we have together and some sort of bread or cracker. We'll share that at the end of the message here today. As you can see on the screen here today, I want to talk about God is doing a new thing. God is all about newness. Wherever God is, He brings new things into being. He created everything out of nothing, and it was all new. And God is continually doing new things. New things in our experience, new things in our lives, new things in our church. God is always doing something fresh and innovative. He brings us a new week. Today is the first day of the week. We're looking forward to this week. We're looking forward to what He has in store for us throughout this new month of June. And there's new experiences that we're going to have as a body of believers here in Alliston, as well as new experiences in our own lives. And with that in mind, I want to talk about the key factor when God does new things, He doesn't just do it out of nothing. He always does it and explains it to us. He gives us an awareness, and there's a process that we go through as we experience the new things that God has. In each of our lives, this is true. It's, new. it's true in our spiritual lives, and it'll be true as we go into the future. And really, it's, it's all based on knowledge. Knowledge is really the key, and that's, that's the, the primary thing I want to talk with you today about. Uh, Hosea chapter... 4 and verse 6, God there says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. In other words, because they don't know, because they haven't understood or haven't had certain things made clear to them, they go about their lives in a different way and it brings destruction, it brings things that aren't good. In other words, I read it there and it says that if we have knowledge, we should be able to make decisions, we should be able to experience life in a different way and then we won't receive destruction, but we will receive life. That's what we're after. And so as God does a new thing uh, in our world, in our personal world, in our collective world together, uh, God wants to help us together. And so with that in mind, I want to read a passage from the book of Acts. The book of Acts, starting at verse 18. The book of Acts, verse 18, all the way through to the end of the chapter, verse 28. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where he, Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I'll come back if it's God's will. And then he, then he set sail from Ephesus, and when he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Pergia, strengthening all the disciples. Then we come to verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, 
they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of the Lord more adequately. And when Apollos went on to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. We're introduced here to this man called Apollos. Interesting individual. This is the beginning of our relationship with, with Apollos. Apparently, uh, he was a significant factor in the early church. We don't really read a lot more about him, but uh, one of the places that we do read about him, and it helps us to understand the place of prominence that he had in the early church, is when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let me read here. He says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you people who live by the Spirit, as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, because you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting just like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So whether the one who plants or the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Paul here obviously is telling us about the prominence that Apollos had found. Some people were saying, well, Paul's my favorite preacher. I, I, I follow Paul. His teaching's good. Other people were saying, no, no, we, we, we love Apollos. What a preacher. What a great man of God. They were following his teaching. In other words, we see that there was a following. He was prominent in the church. We're introduced here in Acts chapter 18 to Apollos. Look at what it says. First of all, it says his name, Apollos, a native of Alexandria. In other words, he was from Alexandria in Egypt, right on the coast, and he came to Ephesus. Now, most he was a Jew, tells us. Most of the early believers were Jews. It's before the times, really, when the Gentiles had, had, had come into, into the kingdom uh, through this new way uh, that Jesus had made possible. And so he was a Jew that came to Ephesus. It tells us here he was a learned man. He was learned. In other words, he had education. He had studied. He knew what he was talking about. He wasn't just going off the top of his head. He, he, he'd studied. He he'd analyzed all these things. He had education. The, the King James Version says that he was an, not just learned, but that he was an eloquent man. In other words, he could take what he'd learned and what he understood, and he could communicate it. His words were effective. He was eloquent in the way that he spoke. What a wonderful thing to be an eloquent man. We as preachers, our job is communication. We're, we're, we're conveying the Word of God, what we understand, what the Spirit of God has placed in our hearts. And we need to do it in a, an effective way, in an eloquent way. You know, it's possible to be eloquent but not be spiritual. We've got lots of examples of that in our world. People that can get up and, and can fire up a crowd and, and say all sorts of things and, and motivate people but not be spiritual. As I read here about, about uh, Apollos, he was a learned man, an eloquent man, but it goes on and says he had a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He understood the Scriptures. In other words, he'd been trained in the Scriptures. He'd studied the Scriptures. He had a knowledge. He understood the Scriptures as they were then uh, allowed, them, allowed to have. And then it goes on in verse 25. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord. In other words, he'd been shown the, the progression that was happening how God worked, how God worked with His people, and what God's desire was for the future. He spoke, it says, with great fervor. The King James says that he, he was fervent in spirit. The inference there is the Holy Spirit. In other words, just like all through the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people, and there was an anointing that came on them. There was an eloquence that happened. There was a passion that came. He was fervent in his spirit. He, he, he preached like he believed it. It wasn't just something that was coming from his head. He was fervent in the spirit and taught about Jesus accurately, which is a wonderful thing. But then look what it says. Though he knew only the baptism of John. 
He only knew the baptism of John. What was the baptism of John, you ask? And I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. Because it tells us down in chapter 19, verse 4, written there for us. We're going to go into this passage a little later, but here's what it says. Paul says, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. So John the Baptist, he was saying, be baptized, have your sins taken care of, get ready, be prepared. He was the forerunner of the Messiah. So there's one coming after me. I want you to get ready for that. Repent so that when the Messiah comes, you can receive him. That was John's baptism. Paul tells us about it here. And it tells us about Apollos that that's what he knew. That's what he understood. And so that's what he was teaching uh, when he came into the uh, synagogue uh, of Ephesus. He was teaching about because that's all he knew. He only knew about the baptism of John. He'd studied the scriptures. He knew what had come to uh, that point, all the things about history and all the things about God's working with his people. And then this new thing that was happening fairly recently about John, the forerunner, crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, repent and be prepared as the Lord comes. Then we go to verse 26, and it tells us here, he began speak, to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more accurately or more adequately. So he gets up in the synagogue and he preaches. He's teaching about the baptism of John because that's what he knows. He spoke about the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. He hadn't progressed past the baptism of John. He didn't know that Jesus, the Messiah, had come, that Jesus was the Messiah. He didn't know about the teachings and the miracles of Jesus, apparently. He didn't realize or understand that Jesus had gone to the cross and died for the sins of the world. He didn't know that on the third day after he was buried, he rose again and ascended to the Father. He didn't know anything about that. He didn't know anything about the, the giving of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he said, it's good I'm going because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He didn't know anything about that, although it had happened maybe 20 years before that. He was just preaching the baptism of John. That's as far as he had progressed. And even today, it's an amazing thing that here we are 2,000 years later after Jesus, and there's still a lot of people in our world. They've never heard of Jesus. They don't know about Jesus. They only know about certain parts of religion. They've only progressed what, to, to what they've been taught. They don't know about Jesus. They've never heard about the Holy Spirit. 2,000 years after the outpouring of the, on the day of Pentecost of the Holy Spirit, there's many people, there's many Christian people who've never heard about the Holy Spirit. They, they've never heard, they've never experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit that He wants to get personally involved in their day-to-day -day lives. Ignorance is a robber. You know, we have a saying in the English language that says, what you don't know won't hurt you. But there was a little airport private little airport where small planes were flying out. And as the pilots walked out through the door to the airstrip, there was a sign over the top of the do door that they saw as they went out to the plane, to fly the plane. And it said, what you don't know won't hurt you, it'll kill you. What you don't know won't hurt you, it'll kill you. In other words, if you don't know how to fly this plane, if you don't know how this plane works, if you don't know what the weather conditions are, if you don't know how it all works together, you're putting your life in danger. In other words, ignorance is a robber. It'll rob you of understanding. It'll rob you of knowledge. We're struggling with ignorance. In our world today, we've come to the place where, where we're, we're living in the days of fake news, apparently. Everything is in question. You can't believe anything you hear. Some people say, we don't believe that, it's fake news. Other people say, well, we don't believe that, it's fake news. You can't believe anything anymore. And, and, and we need knowledge. We need understanding. And so Paul, as he writes throughout the, the, the New Testament in, in the epistles, in the letters to the churches, his, his whole appeal is that he doesn't want people to be ignorant. He doesn't want them to be without understanding. He wants them to have understanding. He wants them to, to know, to have knowledge. And you can read that in uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 25. I don't want you to be ignorant brothers and sisters. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, uh, verse 10, uh, chapter 12 and verse 1, sorry, it talks there about ignorance, ignorance about God's plan for Israel and for Gentiles and how it all works together. You get to chapter 12 and he says, I don't want you to be ignorant 
I want you to have understanding. You go on to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. Same thing. Paul is saying, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to have understanding. I want you to hear my teaching. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13. We, we know this one well because it says there, I don't want you to be ignorant about those that have fallen asleep. When they die and when they're buried, that Jesus is coming back, that the dead in Christ will rise. Wonderful passage that we read at funeral experiences because... We don't want you to not have knowledge. We don't want you to be ignorant. Now, Paul is saying here, and when I read it in the King James, most of these passages, it's interesting. Paul is saying, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. And, and you've got to be careful where you put the comma. You've got to be careful with your punctuation, okay? Because punctuation is very important. It can say different things. Paul's saying, I don't want you to be ignorant, comma, brethren. In other words, I want you to know. But if you put the comma in the wrong place, Paul would be saying, I don't want you, comma, ignorant brethren. Because they were, right? They didn't understand. You've you got to be careful where you put the punctuation. It can change everything. There was an example of, a, of an English professor who, who, who put something up on the screen. And he wrote down for them, a, man without her, a, a woman without her man is nothing. No punctuation in that sentence. And he asked the students to write that down but put punctuation in the sentence. And so all of the men wrote this. A woman, comma, without a man, is nothing. And all the men said, what did the women write? The women put different punctuation. They wrote, a woman, colon, without her, comma, man is nothing. Same words, all the women said, and we know it's true, and all the men, men would agree with that, right? So it depends where you put the punctuation. Punctuation is very important. Knowledge about where. Because you can have the same words, and those words can say exactly the opposite thing, depending on where you put your, your, your punctuation or where you, where you put your, your emphasis. You've got to make sure you don't put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, right? You've got to put it on the right syllable. Otherwise, you get something wrong. Otherwise, you don't have knowledge. So you've got to understand. Paul is saying, I don't want you ignorant brethren. No, no, no. He's saying, I don't want you ignorant brethren. I want you to have knowledge. And throughout his writings, he makes a great appeal for knowledge. I want you to know. I want you to know. You know, some people think that by becoming a Christian, the knock against Christians is, is that they don't have knowledge. It's all by faith. They believe anything. In fact, they don't know what they believe. They just have a, 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 a blind faith. Paul's saying, I want you to know. I want you to have knowledge. And in fact, if you read through all of Paul's writings, it's an in-depth petition for knowledge. I want you to know. I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you not to know. Here's the mysteries of God. He explains. He teaches. That's what all the epistles are all about. In fact, if you come to, uh, you come to the, the prayers of, of the Apostle Paul, which are recorded in most of his letters, fantastic prayers. He says, I pray. He's got it listed there. I pray before the Father. And in each of the, in his prayers is a petition for knowledge. I want you to know. I want you to understand the depth and the height and the breadth of the love of God. I want you to know that. I want you to not just know it here, but know it here. I want you to experience it. That it's not just a head knowledge, but that it's an experience. It becomes flesh in you. You know it. You know it. You know what's going on. And Paul, on and on, throughout his teachings, throughout his prayers, is always talking about knowledge. Knowledge. You know, knowledge always comes before faith. Knowledge comes before faith. You can't put faith in something until you know about it. You have to have knowledge. Faith is based upon knowledge. It's determined by knowledge. And when you read through the scriptures, as Paul writes them, he helps us to understand you need to have a knowledge of what? Timothy understood. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, he says, God wants everybody to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God is truth, gives us his truth, and he reveals himself to us. He reveals his truth. He wants us to understand the revelation of God. He wants us to understand truth which is God. God is truth. So God wants you to come to a knowledge of the truth. Very important that that takes place. He also tells us uh, in the scripture that 
We should not only have a knowledge of the truth, but we should have a knowledge of the word. We should have a knowledge of the word. Psalm 119, the longest psalm in, in the Bible, 172 verses or something like that, uh, long, but it's all about the word of God, Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. In other words, the word of God brings knowledge. It's about knowledge. It's about truth. It's about understanding. So we need to get our truth and understanding from the Word of God. It's not that we have blind faith or we, God cuts our head off or takes our brains out when we get saved. saved. No, He wants us to know. He wants us to know Him. He wants to know, us to know truth. And He wants to expose that, reveal it to us so that we have full understanding. The highest form of knowledge, of course, comes from revelation. Revelation knowledge. That all of a sudden... The Holy Spirit puts the light on something and suddenly it comes alive. Suddenly we understand it. Not that we uh, didn't read it before, but suddenly we understand it in a different way because the Holy Spirit has shone His light. He's illuminated it. And through illumination, suddenly we understand. That's what Jesus had. That's why people said, wow, Jesus, this teacher, He teaches with authority like nobody else that we've ever heard. Why? Because He had revelation knowledge. He understood it. It wasn't just textbook knowledge written on a page, but it had become life to Him. They heard the living Word, Jesus, explaining, and, and He said, when you've seen Me, you see the Father, you understand. And suddenly, when we see and understand Jesus, we can understand who God is. We understand knowledge. And based on that knowledge, we understand God. Because the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. In other words, faith is based upon the Word of God. You've got to hear the Word of God. You've got to understand the Word of God. You've got to know the Word of God. When you know and understand the Word of God, then you can put your faith in it. And that's the way it happens. And so we have this understanding that comes here in the life of Apollos. He was aware of, only knew, the baptism of John. That's what he was bringing. So let's go back to the passage because it's interesting what happens. In chapter 18 of the book of Acts, verse 26, it says there for us, when he was teaching about the, the, in the synagogue, it says, he began to boldly speak in the synagogue, and when Priscilla and Quilla heard him, they invited him to their home. So here are Priscilla and Aquila. They're in Ephesus now, and, uh, and they, they hear, who is Aquila and Priscilla? If you go back to the beginning of the chapter, chapter 18, it tells us in verse 2 about them. Aquila was a man, he was a Jew, but he was from Italy, from the place called Pontus. So he was Italiano, although he was a Jew. But in Italy, there had been anti-Semitism, persecution of Jews. And so they had fled Italy, and he'd come to Corinth, and settled there. And when Paul comes to Corinth, it tells us here at the beginning of the chapter, Paul, who was a tent maker, met two other tent makers, Aquila and Priscilla. That was their, that was their career. That was their vocation. And so because they understood that, they worked together. Paul came and worked with them as tent makers. And then when Paul moved on to the next place, Aquila and Priscilla decided they would go with him. And they went through a few places and finally settled in Ephesus. This is where the whole concept or the term tent maker comes from. In other words, they could take their livelihood anywhere they went. They would move to a new place and they were tent makers. So they could make tents there. They could support themselves. And, and we today, we understand that as tent makers, tent makers is that you can go anywhere and you can support yourself. You can have a job. You can earn a living. You have finances. But then you can be involved in ministry. You're a tent maker. It still works. This is where it comes from. And so as they settle in Ephesus, Aquila and Priscilla go about establishing a business. They're, they're making tents. Paul is helping, but Paul is off preaching in the synagogue. And then he decides he's going to move on and keep going. And Aquila and Priscilla, their business is pretty good, so they stay in Ephesus. And then Apollos comes to the synagogue. So here you have uh, Aquila on a Saturday night. He's at home in his lazy boy. He's reading the local newspaper, and he comes to the church page. And he reads there, wow, this evangelist, Apollos, is coming to town. Maybe we should go hear him. I don't know if he was reading his paper or maybe he had his iPad out and uh, he went on to Facebook. And of course, you know, you have ads in Facebook. And, and halfway through uh, his Facebook, he, he sees this ad. Wow, evangelist Apollos coming and preaching. 
one week only. You better get out and hear him. Seats limited. Seats are going fast. You better hurry. And so he tells Priscilla, let, let, let's go hear him tomorrow in the synagogue. So off they go. And it isn't long into the sermon when Apollos is preaching that Priscilla looks over to Quilla and does one of those. You know, you know that look that uh, the wife can give because they sense very quickly something's not quite right here. Something's not fully good, you know, there's a problem here. And you know what? As good Pentecostal people, what would they do? Well, what would we do? We'd jump up and say, well, I'm not going to listen to that. I better get out of here. Wow, he doesn't understand. I'm out of here. Thank goodness they didn't do that. What did they do? They understood. So at the end of the service, they were the first ones to the front. And they said, Brother Apollos, great sermon. Thank you so much. How about we take you out for Swiss chalet? Christian chicken. I mean, you know, you can't get any better than that. And over Swiss chalet, while he's eating his quarter dark with French fries, they explain to him, it tells us here, that Jesus has come, the Messiah has come, and his name is Jesus. And here's what John did, and here's how John baptized Jesus. Here's what Jesus did. And it tells us that Apollos heard them, understood it, it became knowledge, he received it, and he believed it. And it tells us that when he moved on to the next place, that he, 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 he refuted, uh, had a discussion with the Jews, and he proved from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Something had happened. Something new had taken place in his understanding. And so here's how it happens. You see, there's steps that happened in his experience. There's steps that happened in both of these times in his experience, and it's the same thing that happens in all of our lives. Knowledge is the key. The first step is knowledge. You've got to get knowledge. So the first thing is, is the basis, the foundation. What did he know? He knew the baptism of John. Because he knew and understood that, he put his faith in it. The second step is faith. You can only have faith in what you know. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by understanding. Faith comes by knowledge. If you know that that chair will hold your weight, you sit down. But until you know that's going to happen, you stay standing. If you know that you can get on that airplane and somehow through the, the miracle of thrust by those engines, it will be able to propel that huge, massive airliner beyond gravity and lift it up into space. Then you'll climb up the stairs and you'll walk in and sit down in your seat and arrive in England uh, after about eight hours. Wonder, you, only if you know that. You've got to have knowledge before you get to faith. He knew the baptism of John, so he had faith in that. Okay, His faith, the third step is, became experience. He believed it. That was his experience. That's what he, that's what he lived by. And because he lived by it, and because he was fervent in spirit, he understood the scriptures and what was going on, that's what he came to Ephesus, and finally he began to preach that. His ministry was based upon his own experience. He could preach it with, with passion because it had happened to him. So here's the progression that happens in, in his life. It starts with knowledge. He knew the baptism of John. Put his faith in that. It became his own personal experience, and when he comes to the synagogue, he preaches that. Now, Aquila and Priscilla, before they pay the bill at the Swiss chalet, have taught him about Jesus, the Messiah. And what happens? He receives the knowledge, new knowledge, a new thing that God is doing. He receives new knowledge that Jesus is the Messiah. He puts his faith now in Jesus, not just in preparing the way, not just being baptized to get ready, but the Messiah has come, died. I ask Jesus to be my Savior, forgive my sins. He has faith in Jesus. It becomes his own experience. And then when he moves on to the next place, he's able to prove from the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. His ministry now is about what he knows. Knowledge determines your faith. Faith determines your experience. Your experience determines your ministry. Your ministry is based upon your experience. You can't minister what you don't have. It's not just about a head knowledge. You need to have an understanding in your own experience that this is right. You can tell people that are teaching from here, and you can tell people that are teaching from here. Your ministry is based upon your experience. Your experience will only go as far as your faith. Your faith will only go as far as your knowledge. That's what happened in the life of of Apollos. That's what happens in all of our lives. It's the same process that takes place. Apollos moves on. 
and we get to chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So here, Paul comes back, returns to, uh, from Jerusalem, and comes back to the same crowd that he, I don't know if it was in the synagogue, or he just met them in a, in a gathering, and immediately he senses something. Something's not quite right here. So he asks them, and you hear it. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? Because obviously you've got a faith in God. You're here gathering. Have you received the Holy Spirit? They say, what are you talking about, Willis? Whoa. What do you, we don't understand. We don't even know what you're talking about. We don't know the Holy Spirit. So he says, well, what baptism did you... Because obviously if you're a believer, you've been baptized. What baptism were you baptized in? And they say, well, John's baptism. John's baptism. Why? Because that's all they'd heard. That's all they'd heard. Paul explains to them from John's baptism about Jesus, just like Aquila and Priscilla explained to Apollos. Apollos apparently left town, left those disciples with that understanding, didn't follow up. And so Paul follows up and he says, Jesus has come. He's the Messiah. When they hear it, they put their faith in Jesus and they're baptized in water. And more than that, Then he explains to them that when Jesus went to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit. They put their faith in that. Paul lays his hands on them. They receive the Holy Spirit. About 12 people. And it tells us then in verse verse 10 that for a space of about two years, these 12 people worked with the Apostle Paul there in Ephesus and he established the church there until everybody in the area had heard that Jesus was the Messiah. So what happened? The same progression took place. Paul, here's what their knowledge is. Their knowledge was the baptism of John. They would put their faith in it. They'd been baptized by Apollos, the same way John the Baptist uh, baptized people, including Jesus. That, that was the extent of it. But when Paul comes along, he says, well, what baptism? Because there's something not right here. You haven't received the fullness of it. See, there's four baptisms that are talked about in the Scripture. And some of us get a little bit confused by that. First of all, there's John's baptism. We've read about it. It precedes the other ones that we talk about in the New Testament. Baptism of repentance, prepare the way for the Lord, the Messiah that's coming. Second baptism is about the baptism into the body of Christ. We talked about that a few weeks ago when we talked about membership. And in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, it says that when you're baptized, you're baptized whether you're a Jew, Greek, black, white, male, female, poor, rich, short, tall, doesn't matter. You're baptized into the body of Christ. That's the common element. Doesn't Those other things, yes, they're different, but the common we're baptized, we're immersed, we become part of the body of Christ. Third baptism that's talked about is water baptism, where you're baptized in water. Paul takes time to teach us about that, that it's an outward sign of what's happened inside. You've accepted Jesus, old things have died, you've been born again, and so you stand there and the, the pastor or whoever it is is baptizing you, immerses you in the water. You're baptized into the water. And by doing that, you're saying it's like I'm buried. The old person dies and the new person comes up to newness of life. Old dies, buried, new spiritual body. I'm born again. Okay, Water baptism. And the fourth and final one, of course, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which means to be immersed in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to do the work of Jesus in our hearts so that we're saved. But now there's a next step. We're baptized in. It's not just the presence of the Holy Spirit, but we are immersed in the Holy Spirit. We let Him be in control. We let Him work and live inside us. He brings the power of God. And that's what the book of Acts, starting at chapter 1 and especially chapter 2, verse 4, on the day of Pentecost, they were all filled. They were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And to this day, we believe that the baptism Baptism of the Spirit is for today. The Holy Spirit still baptizes people today. We're immersed in it. So these folks hear all this. Okay, They'd heard about John's baptism from Apollos. Paul comes along. He gives them new knowledge. He tells them that Jesus is the Messiah. They put their faith in Jesus. 
They get baptized in Jesus' name. Then Paul says, well, let's go to the next step about the Holy Spirit. He teaches them. He gives them knowledge about the Holy Spirit. They put their faith in the Holy Spirit. He lays his hands upon them. They all receive, they experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being fully involved and giving leadership in their lives. And then it tells us that alongside Paul for two years, these 12 individuals taught and teach, uh, taught all around the place and helped people to understand in Ephesus and around the whole area that Jesus was the Christ, that the, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, ministry was a result of their experience. It was that way for Apollos. His knowledge determined his faith. His faith determined his experience. His experience determined his ministry. In the life of these believers, their knowledge determined their faith. Their faith determined their experience. And now their experience determined their ministry. Ministry is the highest goal. That's what it's going to tell us here on the bottom of our screen because that's the whole desire. It's not just that you can have knowledge and be filled with knowledge and get all sorts of degrees so that you have knowledge. What are you doing with the knowledge? Okay? And spiritual knowledge that it's talked about in the scripture here, which is the key, which is the basis, which is about God doing something new in your life, about God taking you to the next step or to a new level, is about God giving you more understanding. I want you to know. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. I want you to know. And when you know, you can put your faith in it. When you put your faith in it, you make it your experience. It's not just that you know it in your head. Christianity is about an experience, a relationship. God is your father. God wants you to be his child. And then experience is there so that you will get involved in ministry. Ministry is the highest objective. That's what it's about. All of these things work so that you've got something to minister. You can't minister what you haven't experienced. You can't experience what you haven't put your faith in. You can't put your faith in what you don't know. So in all of your getting, you've got to get knowledge. You need knowledge. It's up to you. It's your responsibility to get knowledge. Listen to preachers. Ask the Holy Spirit. Read the Word of God. You need to get knowledge. The more knowledge you've got, God can use that knowledge and you can put your faith in it. It becomes your life. And then you get to ministry. God wants to do that. It's based upon knowledge. That helps us to understand why a lot of people, they don't have the knowledge of the truth. They've got knowledge in something, just like these believers in Ephesus had a knowledge in the baptism of John. It was real, but it wasn't the fulfillment. It wasn't all that there was. And many people... They've got a knowledge of something, and that's where they're living. That's what they know. That's what their, their, their background, their culture, their, their relationship with God is based on that. That's what it is. Jesus has come to give us life full and abundant. He's come to give us all knowledge. He's come to show us the Father. He's come to show us the purposes of God. He's asked the Holy Spirit to come. He sends the Holy Spirit when He's gone back to heaven so that the Holy Spirit will be in us and teach us so that we will not be ignorant brethren, but we will be aware. We will be full of knowledge, right? And so ministry is what it's all about. We need to be involved in ministry. God hasn't given you knowledge just so that you have a personal experience. He wants you to live that out. Your life is a testimony to the knowledge that you have. What are you doing with the knowledge that you have? What are you doing with the faith that's been placed in your heart? What are you doing with the experience that you have through Jesus Christ with God as your Father? How are you living? How are you living in front of other people? How are you telling other people who don't have knowledge, who don't have Jesus? What are you doing with it? Ministry is the highest objective. Ministry to who? Well, three quick things. There's ministry to God. We get to minister to God. Worship is about ministering to God, about blessing Him, about glorifying Him, about making Him feel honored and, and, and magnified because He's God. He looks for that. He, he loves and He dwells in the praises of His people. We have the joy of being involved in ministry to God, all based upon what we know, upon our own personal faith, upon our experience. We're children of God. We're full of Him. We're in relationship with Him. We want to love our dad. We want to love God as Abba Father. We minister, number one, to God. But then we minister to one another. There's ministry to those that are in the church, that are our peers, that are our, our fellow colleagues. We minister to one another. That's what the church is about. We're all part one body. We love each other. We bless each other. We build each other up. That's what the body is about. It's ministry to the body. You're not just here to be uh, uh, an appendix that you can take it or leave it. No, you're here to be a functional part of the body so that you're involved in ministry to the rest of the body. That's why it's talked about as being, as being 
part of something bigger. We're all involved. We've all been given gifts and abilities, ministry to one another. And then thirdly, there's ministry to the world, ministry to people that don't know Jesus, ministry to people that need Jesus as their Savior, ministry to people who have not received knowledge that Jesus has come, He's died for their sins. Their sins can be forgiven. They can become children of God. They need to get that knowledge. We need to minister to them in love and caring so that they will put their faith in Jesus. Because if you don't have faith in Jesus, you're not going to go to heaven. He's the only way. He's the truth. He's the life. And when they put their faith, it becomes their experience, just like it did with you and me. We become children of God. We're called upon to minister to the world, to care about them. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Love people. Care for them. I love the passage as it's written in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. It says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's talking there about Jews and Gentiles. doesn't matter who or what you are. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, rich, poor, short, tall, anybody, whatever language, whatever background, everybody that calls them. Why? Because the Lord is anxious to save. But then it goes on and it says this. It says, but how can they call upon one in whom they've not believed? How can they believe in somebody that they haven't heard about? How can they hear unless somebody tells them, teaches them, preaches to them. And how can somebody preach or tell unless they're sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news. What's it saying here? It's saying that our ministry is to get the message out. Because when the message gets out, when they get knowledge, they can call upon the name of the Lord. They can make salvation their personal experience. That's what it's about. That's what the church is about. We are here to, to, as the body to love the body and to teach and to build up so that we can be involved in ministry. The future is about ministry. God's called you to be involved in ministry, to help other people to experience what you've experienced. Hallelujah. Let's pray before we partake in communion together. Father, thank you that in this process you are at work. And I thank you that you've worked in each of our lives. You've worked in my life. You've helped me. You've spoken to me. Thank you that there's been a willingness to respond and to, in faith now, receive based upon what I know. And you've come into my heart and my life. For each person watching today, Jesus, come into our lives. We accept that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's come to die on the cross so that our sins could be paid for and forgiven by God. We could be restored into fellowship. Thank you, Lord, for that in our lives. And today, we want to be able to be involved in that. Help us to take the role that you've called us to with the gifts and abilities that you've placed in our lives, with the opportunities to love our family, to love our neighbors, the ones that we go to work with, the ones that we go to school with, so that they'll see Jesus Christ alive in us. He's made a difference. And we'll be able to share with them and love them and minister to them so that they too will come to find Jesus Christ to be their Savior, their all in all, the one who's got good things for them here on earth and heaven waiting for each of us. Thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want you to take your communion emblems today as we come to the conclusion of the service. We're going to read these familiar words that the Apostle Paul wrote to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As you take the wafer that is there, these are all together in one little package which makes it very simple and easy. And Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the, the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. He's telling us the same thing here. I want you to understand what the Lord has done. I want you to receive knowledge. And then I want you to put your faith in it. And now here's a little opportunity to experience in your body what really has taken place in the spiritual thing, the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, you make it part of you. You're agreeing. You're saying, this is my life. My faith and my trust is in Jesus. Right? That's what we're doing. Now he tells us 
you need to make sure your knowledge is right. Examine yourself. If you don't have right knowledge, you can eat and drink judgment on yourself. In other words, you don't fully understand. You're not receiving Jesus the way that he came. Maybe you're doing it selfishly. Maybe you're, you're treating the, the death of Jesus to give you a ticket into heaven, but you're living just like you did before. You haven't been set free from your past or from your sin. Jesus wants to come and give you a new life. He wants you to be born afresh spiritually, that old things would go, that you would have a new lifestyle, a new, a new relationship, that God would be living in you by the Holy Spirit. When that becomes knowledge, he says, I want you to eat that bread and drink that cup. So would you take the bread and let's eat it. In thanks to Jesus for giving his sacrifice so that we could know the Father. And then let's take the cup, the juice, the blood. What symbolizes the blood? Spilled for us. That washes away our sins so that God can accept us. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. Thank you for giving us new life, a new covenant, a new relationship with God. We accept that. We know it's true. Wash us and cleanse us from our sins. Forgive us so that we are right with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's drink. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray your blessing upon us as we go into this week. Give us, by the Spirit, fresh minds so that you can do a new thing inside us, that we will want your will, that we will want your purpose, that we will want to go where you're going and, and do it the way you want life to be lived. Help us, Holy Spirit, to be about your business, to be ministering the joy and the love and the fellowship that we have with Jesus Christ and with the Spirit of God to those that we come in contact with throughout this week. I pray your blessing upon us so that we will be a blessing wherever we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. May you have a great week. In Jesus' name.